yeah, the evacuation was a huge success and we don't study that. We always look at the failure and why it failed. And what's quite interesting is lots of people put blame and they put their fingers and point it at the generals and the staff officers um, who um, allegedly, another myth, put the Australians on the wrong beach or the British against heavy machine guns. But funny enough, it's the same staff officers and generals who planned the landings who also planned the evacuation. So how can I get it you know, so wrong for the landings but not for the evacuation? And really, you know, the landings we can study separate, they're basically put together in 36 days. D-Day took 18 months, and as you see what well, a huge success that was. The evacuation, again, they almost had eight months to plan that. So it was always in the back of the mind was how could we get off of this beachhead if we needed to. And few of the examples of why that was successful was firstly Can they I just stop you there mm, bit of, sure. why why would it be dangerous for an army to evacuate? You know, they're actually turning ah, up yes. what, yep. what's the problem? Why, why why did it have to be so carefully planned? Yeah. What's the, likely to happen? Yeah, the problem with evacuation is you're in contact with the enemy. So how can you evacuate without heavy casualties and without the enemy knowing that you're evacuating? Because as soon as the enemy knows you're evacuating, they would then throw on artillery bombardments to your beach areas where the ships are evacuating off Aren't and probably attack. To see you go, there is stories about, you know, were the Turks, you know, did the Turks let us go? You know, were they happy? Did they have enough of the fighting? But I don't think that is true. There was one attack down on the Hellas front a day before the final evacuation and they probably had a feeling that the British were withdrawing troops, possibly evacuating the whole front. They attacked um, early in the morning um, and came up basically up front to this Vickers machine gun manned by, funny enough, only a few British troops in those trenches at that time. That gun firing was enough to get the Turks to go back into their trenches and that was the end of the attack. I suppose the difficulty is that they think that if, you, if somebody evacuates with all their forces, then they've got the potential to, to attack again. Absolutely. So that's what that's, that's, that's a very good element of that as well, is if you can destroy that, it'll be a fantastic sort of propaganda they put into the news that they destroy the British army. Mm -hmm. They did not want to let them go as a entity together where they could fight elsewhere against the Ottoman Empire. So how did they make a success of it then? Well, um, many, many ways. Uh, one, through deception. What they did for many, many weeks before the evacuation was made everything look normal. So the normality at Gallipoli would be lots of boats coming ashore during the daytime. These would be boats taking supplies, horses, men, equipment, and landing them on the beach. What they did was take empty boxes and troops coming ashore. But what they also did at night time was to evacuate the real standing army. So the boxes that looked like store build up were empty crates and really they were taking off the real stores at night, the wounded, the guns, the mules and the frontline troops, thinning out the ranks as much as they could do to allow them to one, secure the front line but also give the best chance of getting most men off supplies as possible. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> what about this story I heard about um, guns that operate by water dripping onto the trigger. Ah, the drip drip rifle. <laughs> yes, fantastic invention. Um, allegedly come from an Australian soldier who developed this rifle um, and he um, look, looked at how they were sniping and they built this sort of wooden structure to put the rifle on top. Um, it's almost like a trellis which is to fire over the top of the trench. So what they did was retain that but put two mess tins and these are two metal mess tins one full of water with a couple of small holes in and another one underneath which was attached by a piece of string to the trigger. The water would drip out slowly into the second mess tin. The weight of that mess tin would drop and eventually put pressure on the trigger and fire around. Yeah. So when they evacuated the trenches, the very last person would fill this up with water. So even hours afterwards, gunfire was going off. Do you think there were lots of these or just a few? There were a few of those, there weren't yeah. lots, and Good it was story. just, let's yeah. say, sort of part of many, many different techniques. Yeah. Because the, um, the, the Royal Navy was still shelling as well, yeah. so still staying to timetables and bits and pieces to give that deceptive type of uh, feeling to the Turks. And eventually, how many men were actually taken off and how many were killed? 
and they, during the evacuation? Um, they took off 150,000 troops, around 2,000 mules, 400 guns, and a multitude of supplies as well, ammunition, food, equipment, as much as they could take off. Yeah. No casualties at all. Absolutely a glorious success. So there were actually two different evacuations. Up at Suvla and Anzac were evacuated during a long week, but the last troops were taken off. Um, uh, can't remember now. Um, they, yeah, they were taken off in December 1915. Um, what is even more amazing is they managed to pull the wall over the Turkish eyes again um, a few weeks later at Cape Helles, where the main British elements were, and they did exactly the same thing. They withdrew the army down there again in contact with the enemy. So you can imagine how close some of the trenches were at that time, and again, no casualties. And people do say, oh, the Turks let us go, but I think from evidence that wasn't the case. I, I gather that there were um, some casualties in horses. Yes, unfortunately, with the timetable, and it's winter, remember, so the, so the weather was probably the biggest enemy they had to contend with, the biggest challenge, was they had to leave a lot of stores behind, which they burnt and blew up. They also had to leave a lot of the horses and the mules behind. So unfortunately, they did kill a lot of them. And there's a valley now in Cape Helles that you can still go to, and it's still full of bones. Um, lots of the locals are taking them away as souvenirs, but it's not that difficult to look through the scrub and find possibly a mule's head or a bone from one of those slaughtered 100 years ago, um, almost today.